Hi, welcome back to Sisterhood in Surgery, uh, the DeBakey CV Live series. Um, our October show is Workforce Shortage in Vascular Surgery from Recruitment and Retention. As always, my co-host, Palma Shaw, is here with us, and we have three wonderful guests today, uh, Dr. Coleman, Dr. Kemp, and Dr. Pilato. And remember, this is a live show, so you can um, send in your questions through the web, enter DeBakey to pollev.com and respond with your question, or by text DeBakey to 37607, and we will try to um, get your questions answered by our um, guest today. Palma, do you wanna start with, um, oh, we already have a question. Uh, start with uh, um, uh, the introductions. Sure, it's really my pleasure. Um, we're so excited about our guests today. We really appreciate not only their time that they're taking to spend with us, but their expertise well-written and, and well-known in this uh, venue. So we've had many views, but this is the one we're focusing on today. So um, it's really my honor and privilege to introduce one of my a friend and colleague, Dr. Dawn Coleman, who is a professor of surgery, recently transitioned from her post as the program director of vascular surgery training programs at the University of Michigan, to now hold the position of division chief of vascular surgery at Duke University. She graduated with honors from the University of Cincinnati in 1999, earning her medical degree from the University of Cincinnati's College of Medicine in 2003. She completed her general surgery residency at the University of Michigan in 2010, going on to complete a two-year vascular surgery fellowship at the same institution in 2012. She's the current president-elect for the Association of Program Directors in Vascular Surgery, co-leading the vascular arm for the second trial. She also served uh -oh. the Army Reserve assigned to a forward resuscitative surgical team having been deployed on three occasions to support forward operations in the Middle East. Why is it? Her clinical and translational research interests encompass a unique <laughs> pediatric vascular surgery practice and her research leverages a multidisciplinary team to deeply phenotype patients with renal vascular hypertension resulting from aorta renal arterial dysplasia. She's made several high impact research contributions to this rare disease and received major funding from the Taubman Institute, NIH, DOD, and PCORI. She leads an international PRVH patient-centered outcomes research collaborative and has convened expanded stakeholders to prioritize further research goals. Welcome, Dawn. Our next guest is Dr. Kelly Kemp, who is an associate professor of surgery and co-director of the Limb Preservation Program and program director for the Vascular Surgery Fellowship at University of Oklahoma. College of Medicine. Her expertise, expertise includes a focus towards limb-threatening ischemia as a high-volume practicing faculty surgeon. She's the author and co-director of a formal multidisciplinary University of Oklahoma Limb Preservation Program, the first in Tulsa. Um, her research interests are in health services and outreach for multiple vascular surgery issues, including limb salvage, um, disparities, bar barriers to quality care, as well as recruitment and retention in vascular surgery. Beque because of her frequent communication, tenacity, and planning, her uh, multidisciplinary group received three independent grants for ongoing pilot projects awarded by the SVS Foundation and from Oklahoma Shared Clinical and Translational Resources Grant. She's the program director of the only vascular surgery fellowship training site in the state, serving as a mentor to trainees of all levels, and she strives towards in intentional and diverse recruitment in the field. We lost, do we lose Palma? Palma? Okay, um, I think Palma's connection is uh, bad. It, do we lose Eric too? Okay, um, I'll just, Palma? Yes. Oh, we, lo we lost you there um, for a second. <laughs> I did, sorry, okay. yeah, internet. Um, I can introduce uh, Dr. Eric Pilato. He's currently an integrated vascular surgery resident at Northwestern University. He is in his second year of his dedicated professional development time. He graduated with a microbiology degree from the University of Michigan and received his medical degree from the David Geffen School of Medicine at UCLA. While in medical school, he was awarded the Dean's Leadership in Health and Sciences Scholarship to dedicate one research year on human dialysis access and limb salvage programs within county hospitals. He was awarded an NIH T32 grant for qualitative research patient decision-making 
on managing diabetic foot ulcers and the vascular branch of the surgical education culture optimization through targeted interventions based on the National Comparative Data second trial. He's currently completing two degrees to complement his interest in healthcare delivery within vascular surgery, a Master's of Science in Health Services Outreach, Outcomes Research, and Master of Business Administration at the Kellogg School of Management at Northwestern University. His clinical interests are assessing appropriateness of care within peripheral arterial disease patients and implementing toolkits to improve diversity, equity, and inclusion within surgery. Welcome, Eric. Um, so we already have questions from the audience, um, and it kind of correlates with what we were going to ask. So what causes the shortage of vascular doctors, and how bad is it? Um, we'll just go through. Um, Kelly, do you want to start? Sure, I'm happy to. So overall, there's a shortage of surgeons. So all surgeons, there's a shortage. Um, and it's projected about 30,000 in 2025, which is just relevant. So about right now, that's where we live. Vascular surgeons, specifically, our specialty is supposedly going to be one of the highest uh, and most in need. The reason behind this is because our cardiovascular disease is increasing and increasing and increasing as well as our patient population is aging, which in turn uh, leads to more chronic diseases and more vascular disease. Dawn, do you have any thoughts on that to add to? Yeah, Kelly's I think thoughts? I can just, I'll add a few comments. Um, you know, I think that healthcare in general is, is threatened as we look forward when we look at national and regional projections of supply and demand. And there's it's really good data to support that. I, I, I sense though that, um, you know, what the data would propose is there are models that predict declining shortages and those models may, you know, be better or worse contingent on what happens as we move forward. The modeling encompasses or accounts for different threats, um, some of which I think can be mitigated and certainly are worsened um, if we think about um, wellness threats to vascular surgeons, burnout specifically, their desire to work, perhaps reduced work hours or transition to less clinically relevant jobs um, or leave the field altogether. And so early attrition is a, is a very real threat to our, our specialty. The modeling would predict that we've got declining shortages really through 2040. Um, and at a presumed medium productivity of about 8,500 RVUs per year, um, the suggestion would be content based on the, the um, what the modeling carries forward. It's projected that we will have to kind of increase our productivity by up to 22 to 25 percent. And this is based on data that came out um, um, from Go at all in, I think, 2020. Um, but I don't think that those modeling um, calculations or estimates are, are really changing at all. And we've also identified data that suggests there are disproportionately affected areas or regions within the United States that are going to feel this shortage even more severely um, based on whether or not a patient resides in an urban or rural setting um, and other specific regions, for example, in the South are predicted to feel this discrepancy more. All right, what's your perception as a trainee coming, just coming into the field? Yes, um, I think I, I mean, I definitely agree with Dr. Kemp and Dr. Coleman. I think one of the big things, especially as a trainee, is that we don't often understand the work conditions in medical school or even in residency as far as how attendings are. And as we've seen in the last few years, especially with the pandemic, everything's evolving and everything's changing. And I think one thing that I've been able to um, see myself is this contrast in what the work ethic or um, expectations are of one generation to the other and so I do you know I have such an exciting fascination for vascular surgery and I've had incredible mentorship across um, the way but it's always you know the the story of it's not what it used to be and that is true and I think what's important is to understand what has changed differently and how can we support the next generation of surgeons and I think that's a very difficult question to ask and I think right now we're at a very unique point where trainees and medical students um, are looking for surgery, but they're also looking for other aspects that may not traditionally be part of it, like more 
transparency and work-life balance. And uh, that's where I've had the privilege of working on the second trial and also working with uh, Dr. Coleman, um, looking at the, van the vascular branch of it. Because I think the big question that we all have is, how can we support the trainees and how can we make our specialty sustainable in the future? Mm -hmm. That's a great point. I, I mean, I, we noticed it. We were actually just talking about this, the, the, different, the difference in generation and the training. I know Kel, when Kelly and I trained, there, there it was just starting to be the 80-hour work week, right? Like, and maybe some of that was a little fibbed a little bit. You know, we would say we only worked 80 hours. And, and, um, and I know, Palma, you've talked about just, like, having a kid and just – being overnight and just so exhausted and working all the time. So um, there is definitely a difference. What do you think that has an effect? You know, because nowadays it's, it's you know, you got to work, you got to make more RVUs, you got to um, produce. There's all these medical records, uh, you know, electronic, we got to sit there at night to do our, our op notes and our progress notes and administration is getting on us. So how do we balance that? with work-life balance as especially when, when we move forward and like you said there's a shortage and we will have to produce more RVUs to keep up yeah that's that's a good question I think I would have a more leadership have more experience especially just because I don't have any experience on how to juggle a lot of these duties but I think what um, I am getting from the second trial itself mm -hmm. is quantifying this data and you know I think surgery at least is very anecdotal for a lot of things that we've done. You know, um, the rigors of it, the challenges, what helps. Um, but most of it is just um, anecdotal or institution specific. And I think we're at the point where we need to quantify this data to really get granular and understand what is actually affecting attendings when they go home. What is putting this pressure and what's, um, how can we mitigate these risk factors for burnout? That's where I'm able to see from my end, but I'm happy to kind of hear more from uh, other attendings to see what their experience has been or what they think could be this. I think, Eric, it's interesting, the second trial, and I know the data that we're ca capturing during the V-site is really trainee data, right? And I think Dawn has an interesting perspective having been engaged with the Wellness Task Force and understanding the you know strong commitment that the Society for Vascular Surgery has made to, to vascular surgeons in general, but also spe specifically for the members. Dawn, do you want to talk a little bit about how they brought that the task force around yeah no i'm really happy to and i really credit our svs leadership at the highest level to think about this um it, it honestly is i think um a concerning trend that wasn't early appreciated um but once we had a few circulations out there it was um staggering to me how many svs members reached out to mal shahan or i essentially suggesting that they were in fact really deeply struggling um, and they were glad that the society was thinking about this. Um, you know, I think that people are kind of burnt out on talking about burnout, but I, I actually think there are a lot of operational inefficiencies and threats that we have to mitigate as a, as a workforce because we really can't risk early attrition um, from any of our surgeons. And I think that there is also a really, really important business case to wellness that administrators can hear and listen to and respond to. But essentially our group has culminated um, kind of full circle to think about understand, excuse me, understanding really what threatens our um, surgeons and what they're experiencing and thinking about how we can optimize um, kind of the individual, but also the larger, larger broader team um, of faculty that are going back and shaping the culture um, and some of the nuances of their institution. You know, but I guess in short, what I'd say is that many of our surgeons are meeting criteria for um, emotional exhaustion or depersonalization, kind of quali qualifying them for burnout. We know that physicians and surgeons specifically are not resilience deficient. So we know that this is not an individual problem. There is some opportunity, I think, for individualized interventions from the perspective of coaching and peer support, other things like leadership development that we're seeing the SBS really implement at a very broad scale. But ultimately, at the end of the day, there is a framework of shared responsibility that has to ensue not just between the individual surgeon, but frankly, the culture, the institution, the greater house of surgery, if you will, um, that's, um, that's 
accountable for the work space that we're really supporting. Um, you know, my personal perspective is that for a very long time, healthcare has relied on the goodwill of surgeons mm -hmm. who have kind of stepped up with a service focused, other centered mentality, right? We all went into medicine to help patients and we have worked really hard and endured a lot, a lot more than any other profession perhaps would and could really often at the sake of our own wellness or the relationships that we have with others outside of work. What COVID has showed us is that that's not sustainable. In a way, we've almost been enabling a system um, that's that's a bit broken. And so we can be part of the solution and the change moving forward. I think that's exciting. And if anything, COVID has allowed us to think about that. And when it's appropriate, I'm super excited to share some data that in this era of COVID changes and some relaxations and operational requirements that actually some of our wellness metrics have improved at a large scale. I, Kelly, you wrote a very important paper looking at this, and I know it was presented in 2020, and, and I guess the data that you collected would have really been pre-COVID, but um, would you just want to comment a little bit about what prompted you to write about this topic at that point in time? and? how you were able to gather data regarding that and maybe where we're going with that data. So um, when I was thinking about how to be so supportive of our, our trainees, as well as our new faculty, um, it's what prompted us to utilize the survey that you're talking about. We looked, um, it's a new point survey we looked at um, responses to um, why they chose the profession, where they were located, and so on. And um, as Dawn already indicated, there are, uh, the responses um, were from less in um, certain areas of the country. Uh, for our survey, it found that the Midwest was really lacking in uh, vascular surgeons, but it also talked about the fact that modern vascular surgeons enjoyed the, uh, their job a lot of vascular surgeons did really think about that the patient uh, care and the uh, particular care that we can provide is really a bonus. The things that Dr. already indicated was that we I can't hear her. Do there Kelly? Yeah. Can you I can't. You you went out for a minute. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Now I now I can. Yeah. So I was talking to this. I didn't know if it was out because we sometimes have spotty internet too. But um, okay. Now we can hear you. So I'm um, I'm not sure where you talk, but long story short, there I really wanted to understand where we are with recruitment and retainment uh, and where we need to go with next. So why do you think why do you think it is the mid the Midwest area that's lacking? So, um, I don't know. I think that's a really good question. Um, I think there are vascular deserts in our country. Yeah. Um, and and I think that it may be just indicative of there are fewer vascular surgeons practicing. Um, there are fewer um, training sites. Um, for instance, again even though we're mid-south, um, Oklahoma only has one uh, training uh, site in the entire state. Um, so I think we just need to um, be creative about how to open up spaces for vascular surgeons um, and trainees to um, have more exposure for our medical students. It's all about exposure. It's all about mentorship. And I think that ties together both what Eric and Dr. was saying too, um, as far as that we need to be really supportive of each other individually and on a global scale. I absolutely agree, yeah. It is all about mentorship. Um, I know, I mean, that's why I went into vascular surgery was because of Mal and Claudia Shahan, actually, so. And Kelly, you you too, right? Yeah. Me too. Yeah. 
Um, well, I was a co-resident with Mal. We went to did general surgery together in an extremely, extremely malignant program that was very pyramidal. And you never knew when you got out of bed in the morning if you were going to finish the day. And um, I think he and I would agree that there's lasting, you know, uh, lasting Im imprint there um, and memories that are very painful um, living through that. And I, I really applaud the leadership and, and Dawn and Eric, what you're doing with the wellness and the second trial and bringing the data forward. I, I applaud you for doing all of that. And I think Dawn, you had some data you wanted to share. Did you want to share some additional well, data you mentioned? What data? I'm sorry, what data exactly? You mentioned a minute ago you were going to give a little additional. Oh, well, I'll just, I'll tell you that I do think a couple of things. And I, I think Dr. Kempe's kind of review resonates with me a lot. And, and I, I want to just simply say that 100% are regional and national societies and everybody that has their boots on the ground. Like vascular surgery is witty right now. We are really effective at recruitment. Um, and this looks different. Our applicants look different than they did, um, you know, not that long ago. And so there's been a lot of intentional investment and effort and um, hard work um, from our um, vascular surgeons across the country that have really resulted in us having several now back-to-back -back very successful matches. Um, we're recruiting really well. Now we have a lot of recruits and potential candidates that we don't have spots for. And so this probably gets back a little bit to um, what you wanted to talk about as it relates to how we can concentrate different surgeons um, and specifically vascular surgeons in different regions. And that's a different kind of set of conversation. But what I did wanna propose is that I think all of our efforts um, are paying off. And um, there's new data that was published last year now, or I guess earlier this year, but reflects data that was surveyed um, at a really high level across all specialties between 2020 and 2021. So this was a survey that went out about six to nine months into the pandemic. Um, when in theory, you really had some frontline respondents feeling a lot of occupational stress and hazard in that early stage of the pandemic. But we also saw the relaxation of documentation and regulatory requirements and the breaking down of interdisciplinary silos, perhaps better team-based care, and importantly, this rapid expansion of virtual care. And um, for the first time, we saw burnout rates amongst all specialties, inclusive of even our frontline specialties, um, emergency medicine physicians, anesthesia physicians, and importantly, surgeons, although vascular wasn't separated amongst our general surgery cohorts. But we saw a reduction in burnout, which had reached a peak of about 54% in 2014, down to um, 45%, I'm sorry, 38% in this most recent survey. And so we had been uptrending for a while and it looks like we kind of plateaued, peaked and we're downtrending now. And I sense that, that a lot of that has to do with some of those um, operational efficiencies and administrative burdens that doctors are facing and feeling and having them relaxed really helped. And if nothing more, I hope that that in itself is enough to kind of fuel enduring change um, in the system. Um, I had a question. What, so, um, and Don, this may be a little bit more uh, towards you since you're going to be uh, president of the uh, program directors. How, 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 do, um, how do they feel about like social media presence and recruitment for you know, med students and, and residents? Oh, I think we're all for it. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I, responsibly, right, and yeah. in a way that um, reflects what you want vascular surgery to look like. I think you can leverage social media in a really positive way. You've got to be thoughtful about your, your audience and what that looks like. And so we have to make sure that we're being contemporary in certain programs and people do this better than others. I just learned something about um, Dr. Piatto today that I had not been tracking <laughs> earlier as far as his social media presence. But the rising generation is gonna reference different platforms. Yeah. Um, and so you've got to think about your audience as far as what you're using. But it's a very real tool to outreach. Um, and I think there are a lot of different institutions locally and then societies at a regional and national level that use it in a positive way to generate a lot of, um, a lot of, a lot of interest. So I think it's a good thing. Eric, can you comment on that? Um, I, yes. So I think with 
that's important about social media is that, like Dr. Coleman said, it's a very powerful tool. Yeah. And um, I think that vascular surgery needs to be part of it. And just because of kind of going back to the competition, you know, especially who are we recruiting? We're recruiting medical students. Medical students are getting so many um, avenues of mentorship from medicine, from other subspecialties and surgery that we need to compete. And I, and I know initially, I think it sounds um, like social media is just another um, you know, thing that you spend time and enjoy. Uh, but I think as we're seeing other companies do in the business realm and in the law realm, this is a very powerful tool. This is how they're able to get their, um, their clients. Mm -hmm. In our world, it can be twofold. And I think it's really important from what I envision social media being for vascular surgery. One is recruitment and retention of the future vascular trainees, showing them transparency, what historically was not done for vascular surgery, showing them why we're better than the other surgical specialties, why people like them who are viewing us deserve to be at the table with us. And then two, I think it's a great avenue for advocating for our patients. I know cardiology and interventional cardiology are incredible at reaching out via social media platforms to their patients. And because of that, we now live in a society where most patients can tell us who their cardiologist is or what an interventional cardiologist does, but not what a vascular surgeon does. Mm -hmm. And I think that is a disservice to our specialty, that we, why not us, along with cardiology? And it should be a partnership. It's not necessarily a competition, but it's also to showcase our incredible specialty, showing how innovative we are. And I think essentially what we always do at interview dates to a national or the social media platform is what's important. I think it's important, Eric, that we learn from you because Don Kelly and I were program directors and you know, I feel like I'm at a certain level and I would hate to think I'm not connecting with my trainees because we care so much about your education and we really want to do the best, but we're really coming in a way from a different generation. And I think that, are we speaking the same language? Sometimes I wonder, do you think we're, are you hearing us loud and clear or do you think we need to do better? No, I think um, that's a great point, Dr. Shaw. I think that leadership is do. I think we're aware that leadership wants us to be the best version of ourselves. They want, you know, we realize that program directors and just attendings collectively, they're there for our training. And that's something that sometimes we don't appreciate as residents, especially early on when, you know, you just feel like you're always in the hospital. But I think what's important to realize is that everyone, especially in an academic hospital, is there because they want to teach the future vascular surgeons. And so I think that is loud and clear. I think it's kind of like you said, Dr. Shaw, bridging the gap. And at the same time, um, I don't think that, you know, if this group doesn't like social media or TikToks or what have you, that you don't have to do that because what's important is to be genuine. And um, back to, I think, DEI, and I know everyone's getting burnt out about the diversity, equity, inclusion, and what that means. I think what's important is that, like Dr. Coleman already reached out or highlighted, is that we have a lot of recruitment. We have a lot of numbers. We're getting more diversity than we ever have before. But what's important is once they now um, you're matched into these specific programs, where does equity and inclusion come in? And I think we all as junior trainees are aware that you're doing the best to get us well educated and be ready to be on our own in the future. But I think we need to learn how to speak the same language and not just as far as training education goes, but other um, risk modifiers that could lead to burnout. And I think that's why it's important that Vascular surgery is unique because of how small our cohorts are. And so, Dr. Shaw, you could say that you want to create a foster a unique culture right now, but in a few years, your integrated trainings and uh, traditional fellows are going to change, and it's going to be a new wave of people who may be very different from who you currently have. So it's almost like this constantly evolving thing where I can't say, I think that's what's very difficult, is that I can't say we should implement everything like this at every program because our programs are so tiny and intimate. And that's why it should become program specific on what your trainees need, as well as what the attendings need. I think you're wise before your years, yeah. Eric. <laughs> very Brilliant, cool. Eric. Yeah. Eric, can I say something really quick? Because um, I appreciate what you said so much. We are constantly being educated. This is so important to think about and chew on. And you're right, every single fellow has something different. Every single resident, every single medical student teaches me too. 
And so it's this beautiful give and take, and we can highlight that in vascular surgery. And I think it's very important as we move forward and think about keep building and growing together. Absolutely. I'd like to just uh, switch over to a topic we were discussing earlier. Dr. Coleman brought, uh, made some comments about this before the show started. And, you know, so we have a shortage. What's really happening? Other disciplines, other interventional radiology, interventional cardiology are potentially, you know, taking different cases, I mean, to take care of the patients because of our shortage. So I guess the question is, how do we integrate with them to get the, take the best care of patients? And then how do we expand our, our circle so that with nurse practitioners and physician assistants and advanced practice practitioners to help us? Because I don't think I can do it without my APPs. I, was, I just ran two different allied health programs, one for the New England last weekend and two weekends ago for the Eastern. And we have widely incorporated them into the fabric of those two societies. And I think that SVS is trying to do that as well. So I'd love to hear people's thoughts on how we're going to adapt. And our ultimate goal really is best care patient, right? How do we do that now with the shortage? Maybe Dawn, you could um, elaborate on the few things you mentioned earlier. Yeah, well, I guess I, I frame it from the perspective that we have to have enough humility to appreciate that there won't be enough of us to offer all of the care our potential vascular patients will require. Um, even if we're able to onboard new training paradigms, um, it still will take some time. So the deficit is very real. Um, if we're going to keep the patient in our focus, then we have to appreciate that there are going to be others that can help us. Um, and it ends up, I think, being a bit of a balance, acknowledging how you can ration resources, especially in these underserved places. And this is, um, I think, a topic that has gotten a lot of discussion, and I think it's a lot of really colorful discussion, often one that inspires a fair amount of controversy and conflict because people have strong opinions. Mm -hmm. um, but this was the fodder of discussion for many a past SVS president. I think most notably the Future of Vascular Surgery Task Force that was convened by Dr. Macaroon um, and continues to be a discussion item. And I think that um, there are a couple of ways to look at this. And one is how do we train more vascular surgeons? The second is how do we um, continue to um, uh, grow extenders or extensions of vascular surgery and partner importantly with our advanced practice providers? Um, and the, the third is how do we interface with um, interdisciplinary teams and specialties specifically that do have some of the same overlapping skills that we can offer patients, knowing that there are some nuances, some really special nuances of what we do that can't be done by others. And I'll just suggest that if you look at the number of active physicians by specialty, interventional cardiology and vascular interventional radiology are growing like gangbusters. 50 to 85% increases in the numbers of these providers over the course of the last decade. And we're seeing also more trainees coming out of these paradigms than what we're able to match as a specialty. And so whatever we're feeling now is going to be exponentially mm -hmm. um, uh, progressed over the next decade. And this is where I think it becomes important to think about, again, who's offering patient care where and whatever gets somebody to a vascular basin of care, I think that matters. Optimizing access to care matters. Interdisciplinary um, uh, work is really important. And this is probably in part where our evidence-based practice guidelines and our accountability guidance um, are going to be really important. But if we, if we operate fully in a silo and we don't partner at some level, I do think we're doing a disservice to our patients on kind of all of these fronts. And so we will need to be somewhat resourceful, but importantly, strategic um, as we move forward. Yeah, uh, you're, you're absolutely right. Um, I wanted to, uh, we, we did, ha um, we had a few articles that we had looked at pr uh, prior to this webcast. And I was just curious, um, Eric, you'd, um, publishing, you know, mistreatment among female vascular surgery trainees. And, and one of the findings was 
Um, a lot of these sources of discrimination were actually from patients and um, patients' families. And it, I, just, I just wanted to talk about that because just yesterday I walked into a patient's room and he said, oh, the nurse is coming. Um, and then when I said, I'm not the nurse, I'm the surgeon, he goes, oh, you're the doctor? Like, like not hiding his surprise at all. Um, and so, and this probably happens, I don't know how often, but fairly, I mean, I remember, you know, I mean, it, it's not infrequent. So how do we go about um, solving that problem? And I mean, I would love to hear from the whole, the whole panel about how, how do you handle that and how do you, um, you know, minimize that sort of discrimination? Yeah, that's a very good question. So the yes, um, the paper that we did as far as female discrimination, we did look that overall most of the sources of mistreatment were coming from patients and their respective families. Um, but whenever we did a subgroup analysis where we looked at uh, very specific training uh, questions like they felt that um, training did not feel that the autonomy was there or felt that they were given less opportunities in the operating room, that came specifically mostly from attendings. And so uh, the purpose of our paper is to highlight that there's multiple sources of mistreatment, but I think really important, and it's come up a lot, is what do we do if it's patients and their families? Mm -hmm. And a lot of that is very, it's out of our control. Most of the time, um, the trainee is the only one that can take care of them along with the attending. And also at times we're all coming from large referral centers where we, it's very unpredictable who's going to come in. And at, regardless, I think what's important is to understand we as vascular surgeons are doing our due diligence to take care of our patients, regardless of where they're from. What becomes difficult is where we're at this impasse and there's a lot of mistreatment and that should not be tolerated. Um, what we are seeing as far as to mitigate that is there needs to be very sound training programs in each institution. And trainees and attendees should be very aware of this. Um, and for example, I think Mayo Clinic has done an excellent job at having this zero tolerance policy where regardless of what healthcare provider you are in the system, there's a um, mechanism, a referral in order to address this infliction if it does happen. And uh, this is a very important thing that should not just be a vascular specific thing, it should be institution driven. Mm -hmm. um, I, that's a, the shortest way. Um, but I think the most important thing is for trainees and attendings and whomever to have a safe mechanism to report it. The issue about um, patient um, mistreatment or source of mistreatment is that it can really deviate the standard of care at the time. Um, it's really hard, I cannot imagine, having to be a trainee and having to veer off when they're already in a busy day or be an attending and having to deal with this mistreatment. However, we need to start normalizing to create what ifs on what is the best approach to tackle this, but it's not easy. For sure. Kelly, do you have comments? Mm -hmm. The thing that I would say from a standpoint is, Linda, yeah, I've received that type of commentary many, many times. Yeah. And I think the most important thing is that, and is that we are all very supportive of each other. Can we verbalize it? Uh, can we talk about it? And then also, can those, if it happens to a trainee specifically, can the attending, will the attending step in and discuss with the patient? Uh, these are our certain expectations. I think Eric is completely right. We need to do this also at an institutional level. But the thing that is important is supporting each other, talking about hard things. This is one of the hard things mm -hmm. that happens when we Definitely. Dawn, do you have any thoughts about that, uh, hand handling these difficult situations, particularly since you're leading the second trial in the vascular side? Yeah, I think we have a very real role to play as surgeons and as educators um, and as leaders. And so I, I amplify everything that Dr. Kempe and Dr. Piatto just said, um, and I, I support all of it. I'm so sorry if there's a lot of noise. We have a really severe thunderstorm and there is hail and drums. <laughs> so, oh, wow. I, don't I, hope, so. I don't know if you can hear it. No. Um, so I apologize. 
But I guess what I'd say are kind of a few things. The first is that you um, have the opportunity to be a really active bystander. And so if there is an episode or um, a conversation that ensues, especially in front of you, I think it's your obligation to respond um, always in support of the trainee. Um, the second thing I'll say is that there are institutional policies that you can reference and there are ways to debrief this at a really large level. And so it may be outside of the full scope of a program, right? Like we know there's a problem talking amongst yourself as a training paradigm just may not be effective, but engaging multidisciplinary stakeholders like your nursing partners, right? Um, and how to kind of also be cognizant and appropriately responsive and then thinking about frankly, behavioral contracts with patients when their behavior um, is, you know, incredibly out of line and we and we see that. And so you have them sign the behavioral contract. Um, and I've observed and been a part of patient interactions where um, behavior that escalates to, you know, true mistreatment that is continued despite, you know, um, um, an intervention and in violation then with a behavioral contract that's kind of formed and put in the medical record can lead to those patients being fired. Obviously not in the midst of a really acute medical problem where they're not stable, but we've had patients transferred out um, in response to that. And the final thing I'd say is just be supportive to that trainee and your partner if you know that's who's been the um, kind of victim of that mistreatment. But there are really um, kind of meaningful ways to talk about and to debrief these um, in the form of cultural complications and thinking about even larger scale institution. Like we had a cardiovascular center, m and and um, in theory that could encompass something like this. And so just, I think, making sure that, that you're responding when you need to, you're setting the tone, um, you set um, you know, the, the values and the mission of your institution and will be able to at least direct patients in a way that allows them to understand um, how you're going to prioritize these interactions um, at the highest level. This is just so important. I wanted to turn a little bit to um, Kelly named several possible interventions in her article about how we should move forward with this uh, particular shortage. And one I think we've already touched upon is creating collaborative work environment. So we've sort of touched on that with our our advanced practitioners and our interventional radiology colleagues and supporting each other when there's a difficult time and having these hard conversations, as Kelly just mentioned. Um, and another thing that she suggested is rebranding of the field, prioritizing work-life balance. And I think, you know, I'd love to hear people's thoughts on that. Uh, where do you think we, uh, do you think we're moving in the right direction or are we behind or are we, are we doing well? Like, what's your sense on that? Uh, Dawn, do you think we're doing well from a, program director's perspective? I mean, I think we can always do better. better. <laughs> Kelly, you think you, you wrote the paper. What do you think? We're, we're making they, some I, progress. It's a progress that everybody needs to meet it. We do a great job in talking about the value of vascular surgery to potential trainees and so recruitment in that sense has been very successful. I think that we can still do a lot better. And this is what Eric was already saying at the very beginning. We need to really see our trainees, understand our trainees, and move forward on what we need for a better life. And from a trainee's perspective, Eric? Um, I think we are on the right track and we could also do better. Um, I think I'm going to quickly just share something to make it more. I think this makes more sense to me. Can you see this slide? So the yes. idea of um, DEI and so we're becoming more diverse and the fo focus now is equity and inclusion. And I think one uh, question I've received, actually a few questions I received from either program directors based on our studies from the second trial is what do I do in this situation? or and I think what's important is, you know, we've come out, we're coming out with papers on female mistreatment as well as racial and ethnic discrimination. And the conclusions of those, as we've all mentioned, are to be supportive to our trainees. But going moving forward is that it's not about a specific um, an, um, antidote, if you will, for fixing female discrimination, racial discrimination. So this is actually the best way that I was able to 
conceptualize identities. And so as most of our, us, as well as our trainees, there's a lot of intersectionalities. And what's important is to realize what is the core. And I think in this case, we discuss it as we are vascular surgeons or vascular trainees. And that's really important. And core is used, you know, it encompasses our personal attributes, our personality, our characteristics, what we as a trainee identify, not what others identify us as. And just like atoms, we're going back to chemistry. We have all these little protons and neutrons and electrons that are various parts of us, which is race, sexual orientation, culture, gender, religion, social class. And just like those atoms, sometimes they come close to the core and sometimes they're far away. And so that's why it's important to really get to know our trainees because yes, they might identify as this, but is it truly part of their, what's concerning them about their well-being? I think this is very applicable to even attendings is that this, you know, what is leading to mistreatment or what is leading to burnout and attrition? And the answer is that it may not be the same for every single person in this group. But I think it's really important to just be aware of this, that it's not just the race mistreatment. It's not just the female discrimination. It's, it's everything. And so there's a lot of intersectionalities. And that's why it's hard for vascular surgeons when we have such a small, tight-knit group that fluctuates every couple of years to figure out what is the best way to deal with wellness. That's really amazing, Eric. I think part of the problem is we're so busy, we don't have to, time to have that introspection. Yeah. I think I would need to stare at that for a good hour and <laughs> to absorb all that. It's amazing. Um, and I wanted to move to uh, one of the other things that Kelly suggested, um, facilitating personal accomplishments in work. I think that's really important. Um, Kelly, I don't know if, if you um, can comment on that. I'm not hearing you. Just maybe leave. It's a little better. Kelly, uh, the studio said it might be the wind from the headphones. Or are you outside? Is that better? Yeah, I think so. Yes, yes. I'm so sorry. Okay. So, um, uh, I. So I'm so sorry, Pamela. Now ask me the question again. Yeah, it was the facilitated better. personal accomplishments at work. Okay, so one of the things that I have seen that makes things better is have a direct leader who wants to see you succeed. So if you find a boss that will really help you to do whatever you want to do, whether that's research or whether that's incredible clinical care, uh, whatever it is that you decide, that makes a big difference. The day-to-day, -day um, the little things that get you down, they go away with great leadership. And it's at all levels. So what about when you don't, let's say you're in a situation where you have an average uh, boss, an average leader. They're not hurting you, they're not helping you. You know, I've looked outside. Dawn Coleman is my role model. She's a supporter of mine. She's my one of my champions. Eric is a champion of mine. Linda, of course, is my champion. So I've reached out. Now, Kelly, you're going to be one, too. So, you know, that's what I've done uh, to try to, like, if I'm not having a great day, my peppy uh, rad tech that I'm working with in the lab, she's my, my buddy today. I explained to her. Um, this is how I, I've been doing that. But maybe, Dawn, do you want to? comment a little about? I think that Dr. Kempe's comment is really important. And I think her data is further supported by data out of the Mayo Clinic, where they actually kind of quantify leadership skill um, and have associated an improvement in job satisfaction and uh, engagement and other wellness parameters with kind of an escalating composite leadership score. And, and that's really in response to being surveyed about the person who's kind of in your direct chain of command. So mainly a division chief or maybe a program director, or if you are a division chief, your department chair. So I think that you can find support and you can find cheerleaders and you can find accountability in a lot of other spaces. Um, and I've always been uh, taught at the University of Michigan that you can lead at every level. And so we are all accountable to each other. I think that's important, but at the end of the day, I think a good leader that you are kind of falling directly under will make a very big difference for 
for how you're feeling and how you're engaged at work. Um, and this is partly why I think leaders need to be kind of continuously assessed and leadership can be coached. Um, and so we, 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 can, we can make that better. And again, this is one of those wellness interventions that the SDS is leading at the highest level, right, with their leadership development program. Um, and so I, I do think this is a very, very important um, element. And I just say that personally, I feel very privileged because I was well led at the University of Michigan for a really long time. And it made a huge difference, even when you're kind of pushing through crises and things that are, you know, dramatically bad, um, people will do a lot for a good leader. Eric, thoughts on that? Yes, I think it's really important to have very sound leadership. And I think what's important is um, I learned this term recently um, from one of the professors at Kellogg, uh, Professor Nicholas Pierce, that we do a really good job at mentorship, but it's sponsorship that we need. And especially for those new trainees that are um, underrepresented or have no prior uh, mentor, it's, it's sponsorship. And in reflecting to my training experience on why I became a vascular surgeon, it was a lot of the sponsorship, um, even in medical school, having a vascular surgeon that, that stuck out his neck for me and seeing that happen across in residency, in research years, sponsorship is what's memorable. And I think we, we see it and we can reflect on people who were sponsors, but we don't necessarily use that term. And I really wanna separate that from mentorship because I think we, we see that a lot and very grateful for it. But I think a sponsor is truly someone that takes you to the next level. And especially in a ever evolving field like vascular surgery, where we don't have leaders that look like me on multiple intersectionalities. And so for me to beg to have someone that looks like me is, is unrealistic. And so we have to then focus on who is a sponsor for this part of my life. And that's why it's important to go back to your domains of identity and what makes you happy at work and also at home. And I think the last thing that Kelly mentioned was uh, increasing hospital administ administration support. So how do we get hospitals to mm -hmm. buy in to how important it is to retain and, and, the well and maintain the well-being of vascular surgeons? I think, um, you know, maybe Dawn and Kelly have can comment. As leaders, uh, you know, you have to interact with administration, especially Dawn now in her new role. She's got more and more responsibility. Kelly, do you want to start? I'll do, I'll do my cover up. If you can hear me, okay? <laughs> yes. Yeah, better that way. Yeah, we hear you better. Um, so, to leadership and is that the value, so the dollar sign. We still can't hear you well. What? How do we? I heard you say that it's important that we demonstrate our value to administration, right? That, that, so our value um, demonstrated both with dollars, but staying in the job and helping being part of the field. I think and, and I agree. I think that you have to basically support your value to your leadership. Um, I agree with Dr. Kempe. I also think there's a there's a very real business case for investing in people and investing in wellness. And that's been nicely described by Shanna Felt and his team. Um, if you can link wellness back to metrics that we care about, right? Um, hospitals and institutions track and pay for things that they value. And most of that falls into the space of clinical productivity, um, maybe academic output. If you're thinking about teaching hospitals and the medical schools, you're thinking about NIH funding or other extramural sources, you're thinking about patient satisfaction scores and everything that kind of factors into your institutional rank. Um, all of those things are compromised by burnout, right? So we know that um, patient satisfaction and quality is compromised when, when physicians aren't well. Mm -hmm. We know that their engagement and then their productivity, both clinically and academically, is diminished when they're unwell. We also know that if you lose a surgeon, it's you know upwards towards a million dollars plus in replacing that surgeon, not just with the recruitment that ensues to replace them, but the lost productivity and the time that it takes for a new surgeon to kind of get back up and running. 
And then never mind the compounding effects that that loss has on the team left behind to kind of make up for that extra work. And so it's very costly. Burnout is expensive. Um, I don't know that the answer, though, is to fully invest in administration, right? I think it is partly investing in administration, but partly investing in really meaningful system level solutions. And so one of the pushbacks you're going to feel, perhaps at an institutional level, is that there are already a lot of administrators. Mm -hmm. Is everybody being utilized um, as they should be? Are people really doing the work that they should be doing at that level? And how can people work smartly? I think at the end of the day, we probably just have too much work. And so how can we simplify um, how, how can we simplify what we're doing and then making sure that people are really doing the job that they should be doing that circles back and feeds into, again, that value system that institutions are going to prioritize? Yep. So I think we just have a couple minutes left, Linda. I don't know if you want to make any closing comments. Um, well, there was one question we can ask. Okay. Is there a projected year where vascular surgeons will increase? <laughs> if we, I wish we knew. Well, I guess, I mean, there's projections, but not certain. But any comments on that question? Well, I'd say we are increasing. We're increasing. So every year, yeah. we're yeah, I, every year yeah. we're training more surgeons. We're just not training them quick enough. Right. But the <laughs> the threat seems to kind of be mitigated between 2040 and 2050, right? But yeah. that's still quite a ways off. Yes. Um, so I, I sense that we'll be innovative enough and we've got a rising generation of smart, um, young vascular surgeons who will help us um, address the problem. But I do think that COVID has allowed us to feel empowered to do things a little differently and that's exciting. You're absolutely Maybe right. a, a closing comment, uh, Kelly, you'd like to make and Eric, about this topic per se. Um, uh, thanks for bringing this to the forefront, um, both to Linda and Pama. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. Thank well, you. I really enjoyed your article. So. Yes. <laughs> and thanks for taking time out of beautiful San Diego. <laughs> Eric, what do you think? Um, thank you everyone for having me. Um, I think this is all very exciting times. I think we're at a point where vascular surgery is about to become very diverse and truly the forefront of leaders in surgery. And I think moving forward, we have just so many opportunities to utilize our mentors. And even the second trial, I think is a perfect opportunity to show us how we can use the current data we have and not look at it as a negative, but what we can do to improve because we're not alone in all of this. So. We're ready to be leaders. Dawn. Bravo, Eric. Yeah, Eric, can no, you be you my mentor? <laughs> <laughs> well, I can't uh, thank you all enough. Uh, I applaud you for all of your contributions to the literature, to your leadership, to your brilliant thoughts you've brought forward today. I learn every show I learn. I just enjoy it, and I appreciate you all coming. Linda, we're good? Yes, yes, thank you so much. <laughs> Have Thank a good you. night. Bye. 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 Have Bye. a good night. Take care.